This is one of the most desirable residences in London, right on the banks of the Thames. But there used to be an even more desirable residence somewhere underneath this immaculate lawn. Richmond Palace, centre of intrigue for kings and queens for centuries. The place where Queen Elizabeth died. But surprisingly for such an important site, we don't know exactly where it is, or even if there's any of it left. We've got just three days, and finding anything without spoiling this place isn't going to be easy. So all of this was the palace. Yeah, fantastic, isn't it? Amazing building. All these pinnacles on the top. Yeah. Where exactly do we think it was? Well, it's all across here with the main building on the lawn where the surveyors are over there. And where do we think it was painted from? Well, it's from the other bank, so it must be somewhere over there where the boaty, the blue boat is, all those trees looking down this way. And where are we? We're actually out here in the middle of the river. <laughs> Because? <laughs> because the river's been narrowed and constrained and we think the original bank is somewhere across in the front there. It is a heck of a massive place. We're, surely we're not looking for all of it. No, what we're going to do is concentrate on that middle bit, which is the inner sanctum of the royal private apartments. That, that big block there, yeah. It's well documented and, and luckily there's a local historian called John Cloak, who I met many years ago, who's done a lot of work on it and thinks he can place that from the documents and maps that existed. Great. So we ought to go and have a chat with him and He'll explain it to us. John? Hello. You reckon Hello you know there. where the palace is? I think so. I've made this plan. We're about here at the moment. So where would the original riverbank have been? Just a few yards farther back that way. Sort of here-ish somewhere? Something like that, yes. And where would the palace itself Well, if we come up this way a little, um, I think probably about here yeah. we would have had the southern wall of the Privy Lodgings building. That's the inner sanctum bit? That's right, yeah, the royal apartments. Are so there. somewhere around, around here, here, Queen Elizabeth would actually have died? That's right. In Ma amazing bedroom. thought, that, isn't it? <laughs> If John's right, then the vast bulk of the privy lodgings, plus a moat and the old riverbank, lie within our grasp, sandwiched between Trumpeter's House, the big building to the north, and the Thames to the south. All under this immaculate lawn, which geophysics have been surveying since crack of dawn. Their work this weekend is going to be crucial, because we've been restricted to just three trenches by the residents. We need good, crisp results to make sure each trench is in exactly the right position. By 10.30, they've got their first printout, which doesn't at first sight look very helpful. Can Mick untangle it? I mean, what I would want to know straight away, I think, John, is how that fits with John Cloak's projected plan that you've got here. Uh, I mean, this, well, is, this, is, this is, you know, reckoned to be OK, but not quite clear yep. to within a few metres each way. If right. we're going to put a trench in on the base of this, you know, do we put it down here or do we put it up here? Well, it doesn't a, fit with what John but, says, does it? I mean, the problem I've got is that map's at one scale, this map's at another yeah, scale, yeah. and the plot's at a different as far scale. As, you can get as far as I can tell, Mick, we've got a change in resistance here, yeah. and that falls roughly there, opposite of this path. path, so it's more so or less that where... that is more or less in line. So you're saying that this line here could be the south side of the Privy Lodgings? It, yeah. It's possible. Yeah. In fact, the geophysics results line up perfectly with John Cloak's estimate of the southern wall. And by 11 o'clock, Trench 1 is underway. Anxiously looking on are the residents of Trumpeter's house, Baron and Baroness Van Diedem and their neighbour Mrs Franklin. This is their lawn we're mucking up. One of the questions we hope to answer this weekend is what the privy lodgings looked like when Elizabeth I lived here. 
This is harder than it sounds, because there'd been a palace at Richmond for nearly 200 years when she came to the throne, and it had been rebuilt and altered several times. The first two palaces were medieval. One built by Edward III in the 1300s, and the second, a complete rebuild, by Henry V in the 1400s. Henry VII, the first Tudor, had to rebuild much of it again after a fire in 1497. And his son Henry VIII may have altered bits of it as well, but we don't know whether the Privy Lodgings building was affected by any of this. So when Henry VIII's daughter Elizabeth was queen, did she live in a medieval building or a Tudor one? And then the towers of this excellent place are turreted and pinnacled. John Cloak has teamed up with Simon Thurley, one of the country's leading palace experts, and they're trawling through the contemporary documents for clues. You've got some exquisite pictures of all that. Haven't you? Yes, we have, and they, they tell quite an interesting story. This is the Elizabethan view by Vingarda, and what it shows is what it looks like in essentially a brick building. And we know that Henry VII's buildings were of brick, and that's one of the important features of it. It was one of the first brick built palaces. But if we look at this painting, we'll see it tells a different story. Here are Henry VII's kitchens to one side, all of brick, but the main lodgings are of stone. And so what we're looking for, if we're going to try and find the main lodgings, are the stone lodgings, which, in my view, seems to indicate that they were, could well have been the same lodgings that Henry V built himself. It's at this point Trench One hits part of the building, just where both Geophysics and John Cloak thought the southern facade of the Privy Lodgings might be, is a wall. Brilliant. But it's not stone, and it's not medieval. Yeah, is, uh... yes. I just handed this brick on oh, well. passing the trench. What do you think of that? Well, I don't do know. It's, it's, that's, oh, what I'd say is that's, that's rather difficult to take. Bricks? This, this bricks. One. bricks? Bricks, bricks, bricks. Yes. Bricks, good. Bricks. bricks. Where's this come from? Then. Just in there, literally, yes. it's just coming it's out. It's not a hole. What a pity, it's not quite, not quite a hole. hole. We haven't it's got... Yes, might I mean, just obviously, the critical thing is trying to get a measurement of these, because we can tell... I and mean, Henry VIII had, had a series of sort of speci you know, specified brick sizes, and so that'd be handy. But it looks like a Tudor brick to me, wouldn't you say? Yeah, oh, absolutely. It's got the right that's sort fine. of dimensions to yep. it. Yeah, yeah, you haven't got a ruler on you, so we can just get a, get a sort of rough measurement of that, have you? Yeah, now that's quite interesting. Now, that that's an eight and a half inch length, width four... Now, if this brick was at Hampton Court, that would be a Henry VIII brick. Right. Definitely. Good. Not a Henry VII, a Henry VIII brick. Mm -hmm. If it were at Hampton Court. So, there's something for us to go on with. Very to begin good. With. Right. That's wonderful. Well, it'd be great when we get There are more Tudor bricks in the wall, though they're a different size, and Berwick and Simon agree it was probably built by Henry VII. Just after lunch, and Mick's having a ball at Trench One. He and Phil have got a kind of archaeological Lego kit to play with as stone after stone comes out of the ground. Oh, look at that. That's a different size window too, it's a, isn't it? It's a different... Well, is, is yes, it, or yes. is that the edge? Just no, the edge, no, it is, it? it is a window. That is a window because, there, but yeah. there ain't one on the other side. Well, we've lost so it, that's the window. So that, that is the edge of the window. Yeah, yeah. so that's, that's this bit that goes there, there, and then that bit goes then in that there. Bit goes there, and then you've got to have at least another, uh, one, another of one of those over there. Over there. Yeah. Yeah. To, um... Mick! Hey, you're not going to believe this, we've got a complete palace here. <laughs> <laughs> Look at this lot. That is amazing. We've, we've got lots oh, of bits cool. of window, sides of window, bits with the where we've even got the lead and bits of glass out of it. Well, it's very good, isn't it? Is Gosh. this Queen Elizabeth's <laughs> palace? Is this part of her where she lived? Well, where she lived, yes, but she didn't put this up. This is, <laughs> is going to be early. We want that. to know the, the the mason's name and the date and what he had for breakfast, right? No, we can't do that. Yeah, but what is it, Berwick? What's, mm -hmm. What is this piece? Because we've stood oh, it up like it? that, but we don't really understand. No, what I don't it think is. it is. I suspect that's another window sill, isn't it? Yep, it's this big stone, which is actually a sill and must have been lying down that way. Which is really that. That's that right. Way. Yep, yep. So it's got a sill oh, right. and then a, a drip below it so that oh, right. the water would, coming off the front would drip down and not run, running oh, down right. the wall. Yeah. But what is interesting is the shape of this funny moulding here. And I say it's a funny one, it's what I call sloppy. It comes right at the end of the medieval period when they're not cutting their curves as precisely as they used to. So this is definitely late, not from I would say an so. older yep. palace. Yep. I would say this is, well, it's, it's much more likely to have gone in in the, re, in the remodelling or whatever happened in Henry VII's reign. Other parts of the Tudor window have survived too. Fragments of painted glass, 
and this bit of lead, which would have been used to tie the panes of glass into the frame. So that's Tudor windows to go with a Tudor wall. But that doesn't mean Henry VII rebuilt the whole thing. He may just have altered bits of it. We won't know for sure until we've dug more trenches. Which should be quite soon, because John and Louis have nearly finished their second area up by Trumpeter's house. It's tea time day one, and we've had the most stormingly good first day. We've got Tudor coming out of that trench like there's no tomorrow. But our job was to try and locate this palace somewhere in this grass. And in order to do that, then we've got to find a second edge, which is why we're going to have to dig a second trench, which hopefully is what Phil and Mick are trying to sort out now with John. What have you got? Well, a few more blobs. <laughs> <laughs> One of which, the white diagonal, is a modern cable. But there are also a number of parallel lines, which might be walls or even the moat. They're all relatively close and could be covered by a single trench. And then 46 metres. But Mix, armed with John Cloak's estimates of where the back wall is, measured from the front. Do the two results tie up? Only one way to find out. I've got a tape here. I'll bring up some measurements. You need at least 50 metres, Phil. I want measurements between 30 and 50 metres. then go up to 46. 16, right on the croquet hoop. Yeah. In fact, the geophysics anomalies are much further north than John Cloak's estimate. And to cover both would mean a trench at least 15 metres long, which is clearly not feasible. So Mick's got a problem. So what we've got to decide is whether if you like, we centre it on that, that, or whether we go rather more this way or rather more that way. <laughs> yeah. Right? Well, it's your choice. Well, the, these measurements suggest that it ought to be back a bit this way, don't they? Explain mm. why. Beca because they're all between 37 and 46. So, in other words, they're no that further than that. No further yeah. than that. That's the outside edge, whereas yeah. John's saying that he's got quite a bit of activity going on around 46, 47. Is that right? Yeah. So and there's, we... there, there could be no sort of discrepancy in your surveying over a metre or something like that. No. no, he looks Look, at me, doesn't this, he? <laughs> this, this, is, this is more likely to be out because this yeah. is people fiddling with the well, historical okay. Okay. information and the, and the surveys and so on. How long are these trenches that we can dig? Well, we've dug one five metres there. Yeah. I would have thought we needed at least five I here. If we, if we could get away five, with a bit yeah. longer yeah. over the full range, yeah. Yeah. then that would help us enormously with the option on extending it a bit. And so we can do that without going and asking? Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you were, it, you were uh, quick there. <laughs> <laughs> it's a shame about the croquet lawn. And so the historian's measurements are shelved and the trench goes in on the geophysics results. Work of art. Which is lucky because the historian's estimates were based on the distance between front and back walls. But the front wall in trench one from which they took the measurements is not apparently the front wall after all. It doesn't really look thick enough to be the main outside wall of the, the whole palace, but it may be one of the windows or the galleries or something butted onto the outside of it. The colour of this earth is completely different on this side to that side. Precisely, that's why we know it is a, it is a wall that separated the inside of the building from the outside. Which raises two questions. First, where is the front wall of the palace? And second, what is the Tudor wall in trench one? Well, what it it could be is this extension on this drawing of 1638 by Hollard there is a porch or a bay or an extension sticking out from here and I'm wondering if what we've got is is that wall there that's exactly where our trench is yeah we've got to persuade the others to actually extend the trench a bit to pick up the real wall that's right I think we need to go three four even five meters further oh, north to, to oh, test that well, hypothesis we'll see whether they'll buy that <laughs> <laughs> 
End of day one, great day, fantastic trench. I think this is probably one of the best trenches we've ever dug on Time Team. What with all these finds and this Tudor wall, which no one seems to think any longer is actually the front wall of the palace. They reckon it's the remains of some Elizabethan conservatory or something. They're now betting that the front wall of the palace is around here somewhere. So. We should be able to pinpoint it tomorrow and they're already taking the turves off that trench over there so with a bit of luck we'll be able to locate the back wall and then we'll be halfway to placing exactly where this palace actually sits on this lawn. And given the number of finds that we've already found outside the palace, heaven only knows what we'll find inside. Join us after the break. Beginning of day two, and this is our problem. We're looking for the front wall of the palace, which we think is somewhere around here. And in order to find it, that means either we've got to extend this trench in this direction, or we put in another trench somewhere around here. Now, if we extend this trench, we're going to mess up the lawn, we'll probably get loads more finds, which we're going to have to spend a lot of time conserving, and we'll use up all our diggers. On the other hand, if we put in another trench here, that means we'll already have dug a total of three trenches. And we're only allowed three by the residents over the entire weekend, so we'll have used up our entire allocation. So what do we do? Mick, what do we do? Another little trench or extend this oh, one? Oh, we've just been agonising about <laughs> this and there's various opinions. Stuart, I think, would like a longer one. We, we're a bit cautious about that. I think we've actually settled on the idea now that we, we're going to come out from this trench about two metres. But two metres... We ignore the geophysics. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> oh, what about the geophysics yet? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I haven't had much time to look at it. I mean, it, things have been so rushed. If you actually stand back now and look at the plot... Yeah. This is where we've put in the trench at the moment. Yeah, across the black and the white. Can you not see quite a strong edge there? But that's ten metres away. <laughs> <laughs> we can extend by 10 metres. No, we can't, no, no, we we can't, we can't we extend deal by... With the volume of no. I mean, I don't know. It's a, yeah. Can well, you look, see look, that line? It looks current, quite good to me. The current discussion is that this wall here that we've got, the brick wall, yeah. might be one of the various little extensions shown on the drawings, right? And Beric's idea is that that's not likely to be very wide because of the span of the roof. There's no way it's going to be it's 10 not metres be 10 wide. Metres. No, no. So that if we only come two metres out here, and there's a, there's a wall there, then that gives us the sort of span you might get for that extension. Ten metres on to the inside. But John, it, al it also gives us the option, I mean, the point you made, mm. that it, if we don't get it in that two metres, we can then extend, or we can dig another hole. But we'd be mad to do more than two metres to start with, in case it's in there. You can't leave anything so anyway. Trench 1 is extended, just a fraction, in the hope that it'll reveal the real south wall of the privy lodgings. This is done, it must be said, on the sly, when none of the residents are around. Mrs Franklin, in fact, is busy elsewhere, with Carenza and perfume expert Maria Liz Balchin. Maria, we've got this recipe from 1527 for damask water. It's from Brunswick's small book of distillation. Do you think you could make this for us? Well, I shall try. Well, we've got a list of ingredients here, which we're hoping you might have in your garden, Mrs Franklin. Um, walnut leaves. We could reach that lower branch. We have to scrunge it. Oh, that's good. Can you smell that? Gosh, it does, doesn't it? Citrus. Yeah. Amazing smell. Oh, that's the Oh, it smells good. That's time. Ooh. It's a margarine. No, it doesn't look pretty. Bay and cypress to finish. No. It's amazing you've actually got everything in your garden here, Mr. Franklin. Everything you want, apparently. <laughs> It's going rather well on the lawn, too. Phil's uncovered another brick wall, slap across the middle of Trench 2. And this is a serious wall, three times as thick as the tiddler in Trench 1. You've got what you call 
a floor here? This, so this could be an interior floor of the palace? I would, I would think there's a reasonable, reasonable bet, yeah. And are you prepared to say that this is probably the palace wall, the back palace wall? I, 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 I'm, yeah, I'm beginning to put money on it. And I don't normally put money on anything <laughs> unless I know I'm going to win. <laughs> At last, after yesterday's false dawn, Trench 2 has given us our first main exterior, the North Wall. Two more, the South and the West, and we'll be able to locate for the first time the privy lodgings of Richmond Palace. And you see where the Baron's house is now? Yeah. What would have been there in Tudor times? Well, can you see just above it, there's, there's a, a bit of an arch showing up. Just there? Just over there. Yeah, yeah. You would have come through that. That's one of the surviving bits of the palace complex into a big courtyard, which also came under where the big house is. And that had a fountain in the middle of it. So there was a, there was a sort of square area with, with uh, buildings around it before you got to the bridge that went across to the private apartments of the palace. And certainly there was a large orchard over to uh, the left-hand side there where that new uh, garden, very nice garden, has been laid out. But there were also gardens and orchards over to the right, uh, down beyond those trees in front of us. Uh, and that's where things like the tennis courts were, which was a thing that was catching on at the time. There were sort of indoor and outdoor tennis areas. The Kings of England had so many royal palaces. What is it that makes this one so particularly important, Simon? Two kings tried to make it their dynastic seat. The first one was Henry V. Um, he died halfway building, through building it, but um, Henry VI completed it. And then there was Henry VII. And there he is on the wall, not looking particularly happy, but he should have been because he just finished building this fantastic building and he was the one who succeeded in making Richmond into the great dynastic palace of the Tudors. Henry VIII, however, found it rather old-fashioned, and it had a sort of revival under Elizabeth I, yes. but after that, it went into fairly rapid decline and, of course, was in the end bashed down after, Henry, after Charles I had his head chopped off. By midday, the morning's drizzle has turned into torrential rain. Extra planks are needed to protect the lawn, trenches are filling with water, Everyone's drenched. The place to be is inside with the perfumiers. And I'm pounding these up here. How, how much do we need? To well, it doesn't pounding? need very much pounding. You're just releasing the essential oils. Is that sort of ready? I think that's you? ready. Yeah. The next stage of the Elizabethan perfume making process will be familiar to anyone who's ever made home brew gin. The crushed up plants are put into the bowl of a distillation apparatus. Add some liquid, in this case rose water, and for a bit of extra zing, some white wine, then simply turn on the heat. And then the essential oils will be liberated and will rise up with a steam right the way up here. And it'll then condense into this tube here. And in a few hours' time, we'll know firsthand what the well-heeled Elizabethan smelt like. It's just after lunch on day two, and all the joy of the morning has disappeared. It's been pouring with rain. We're all absolutely soaked. And now, the wall which Phil promised me was the outside wall of Richmond Palace turns out not to be. Berwick, what is this thing? Well, you can forget that, because that's actually a later wall. How do you know it's later? because it's sitting on the remains of the wall we were looking for. The wall that we were looking for sat here. Yeah. It's been robbed out. Someone got there first. Someone's taken the stone from the wall to use elsewhere. And the big bits of rock that weren't usable are just chucked in at the end. And those are the things that go down there disappearing underneath. How do you know wall. anyone could dig a hole and say, oh, that's where a big wall we, used we, to be? We've got a very, very good edge there, Tony. That is, that is a true edge. That, effectively, is the edge of the foundation trench. The wall would have been built in that foundation trench. So you're pretty sure that what we've got here is the ghost of the wall that was the outside wall of the palace? I still believe it is, yeah. Or at least, I still believe that's where it was, yeah. So do you owe me a pint or not? I owe you half a pint. <laughs> <laughs> that's all you can afford to price a pint. <laughs> A ghost of a wall is better than they've got in Trench 1. 
The extension has produced nothing except more damage to repair when we finish digging. So they've all decided to count this thin one as the front after all. Very convenient. Now all the effort is going into getting to the bottom of it in search of a floor. Efficient though this looks, digging for the floor could take weeks, so they decide to burrow a small hole instead. It's a lot deeper than it was it's, last time I saw it. It's a lot deeper and it's going down. We haven't actually got any evidence for flooring as yet. Right. And so and the wall's still going down, it's, what, a metre below this ground surface, is it? It's... ah. Oh. You've got a bottom. And I can see you've got a bottom from here. <laughs> you've got the bottom of the wall. <laughs> Never. Back at trench two, Phil's trying to find the width and depth of the north wall foundation trench. Oi. Oh, oh. <laughs> Look at that! Bellamine jug, isn't it? Yep. What is it, Phil? Bellamine jug, Tony. What's that mean? They've always got this rather gruesome looking face on. You see that? There's his two eyes and his, his eyebrows. They're very, very ca characteristic. What sort of period would that be? Well, I mean, we're, we're looking at the 17th century. I mean, it'd be absolutely ideal for them demolishing the palace. So it's the right on. period? Yeah. And, and what would have been in it? Usually wine. And how big? Well, I mean, they're, 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 they are quite big bellied, so I suppose you're looking at something like that with a little handle on the side, probably for carrying it and for pouring. Oh, great. Get back there. Yeah. Let's get some more stuff. <laughs> it's four o'clock, and just across from Phil, a new hole has appeared in Trumpeter's lawn. This is our third and final trench, and it's gone in where geophysics think the northwest tower of the privy lodgings might have been. Mrs Franklin's keeping a watchful eye on things, so it's a bit of a relief when just inches under the surface, Mick the Dig hits something solid. Well, what about that stuff in the middle? That looks like concrete. It feels like concrete. <laughs> it looks really hard. Give it a clout. Oh, yeah, all right. Because <laughs> obviously it's going to take us some time to pick that apart. It'll be tomorrow now, won't it? It's got colour in it. Mm, it's wonderful, isn't it? Oh, it's great. As the evening sun breaks through, Berwick and Hazel Forsyth, our Tudor Fines expert, are getting very excited about two pieces from either end of the site. Well, it's a piece of terracotta ornament off the front of the building. It looks almost modern, doesn't it? Well, it could be turn of the century, Art Nouveau, couldn't it? But it's actually it's Henry VIII, probably the 1520s, before he lost interest in the palace, and it's terracotta, just the thing they did in those days, very new, very fashionable. And what about this one? Well, much the same date, but the exciting thing about this one is it's coloured. The paint is still there. This blue stuff here? That blue stuff, it's beginning to break up, but it's there. And what are these leaves? Well, this is typical Renaissance design, acanthus leaves, probably part of a long frieze. These plaques, if you like, were attached, pegged onto the exterior of the palace. So you have a decorative frieze running all the way around, much cheaper than using carved stone. To find something like this with the paint still on it is spectacularly rare, a real triumph for Time Team. Originally, there'd have been thousands of them connected end to end, forming a blue Renaissance halo round the building. Six o'clock, day two, we've got all three trenches in, looks like we've got plenty to do, and just when I thought I wasn't gonna have to go to the residents and ask for special dispensation, they seem to have decided that they want a fourth trench. Yeah. Where <laughs> and why? <laughs> why are you well, looking at me? <laughs> there, and because the geophysics have come up with some interesting data. I mean, basically what we've got, Tony, is a linear anomaly that looks as though it could be the Western Wall and it fits in perfectly with where Stuart says the Western Wall should be. So where do you want to put it in? At right angles to the anomaly, just at the bottom of the bank. Yeah, about, just about down there. Here somewhere? Yeah, somewhere there. Yeah, I'll give you an exact measurement. She's here? Oh, right. Do you want to ask her? Mrs Franklin? 
Mrs. Franklin, what do you want? We would like to dig a fourth hole. Uh, well, how big could. and where? Uh, probably well, about show me where. five right. by one and a half, like the others. What? Well, just as big as the others, then? Like that one down there. Probably, probably only probably about five metres long. Oh, an well, enormous hole in there. <laughs> but the thing is, this is exactly happening what I expected would happen. When yeah. you've got so far with just the three trenches, you yeah. want to go to another trench. And then they go to another trench. And I mean, you're not going to be gone by Monday at this rate. Oh, we are. Oh, out. yeah, no, we have to be gone by Monday. Yeah. Okay. And, and whatever I'm, happened, I'm we, back at this work would be the final trench. It has to be, because uh, we're all finished tomorrow evening. Yeah. Because we can't go on after that. All right. Yes, OK, then. Well, I, okay. I presume the Baron would approve. Well, we'll, we'll ask him. Yes. I think you have we'll ask him as well. Not, not yeah. just by law. No, no, no. Uh, we'll ask him as well. Show. But if you're happy, we can at least say that to you. Yes, you can. Yeah. Yes, OK. OK, that's right very kind are. of you. All Thanks right. very much. But we've got the new results for that area now. Oh, so I'll be having a look at Mixed that powers of persuasion oh, work with the Baron, too. Decide where so, our fourth trench will go in, across where we think the west wall of the Privy Lodgings was, first thing tomorrow. Back in the gazebo, the damask water has been bubbling away for several hours, and the smell of Elizabethan England pervades. Can you smell it now? It, it does smell faintly like decaying vegetable matter, doesn't it? I mean, <laughs> not quite as bad as spoiled cabbage, but a little bit of the rose oil remains there. You have to be very clever to smell the rose oil through the rotting compost smell. <laughs> so. Does one put it on? <laughs> Why don't you? It, it won't burn a hole through my wrist or anything. I don't think so. Actually, that's remarkable. That's, that's, that really, a lot of the rotten vegetables gone out of that. That's it's certainly a, better. A lot smoother, isn't it? Like, well, perhaps they knew what they were talking authentic. about. Satisfied with its bouquet and curious to see how much of the white wine has distilled, Maria decides to go a stage further and taste the potion. Well, let's try. <laughs> 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 it's pure alcohol. I wasn't expecting that. Oh, I get the bar, it's helpful, like cholesterol. Ah. If Maria had only waited another five minutes, she could have had a perfectly decent glass of red wine with the rest of us. As we gather on the banks of the Thames to celebrate a real roller coaster of a day. You bought your waders. Well, it's the end of day two, and it's been a pretty tough day. But as you can see, the sun's come out again, and hopefully tomorrow we'll really crack it in our fourth and final trench. Hear that, Mick? Our fourth and final trench. Oh, really? <laughs> Join us after the break. It's the beginning of day three, and there's still a heck of a lot of work to do. This is trench one, and those are the cellars that went right under the privy lodgings. And there's a lot of digging to do before we get to the bottom of them. Now, not only are we going deeper, but we're going wider as well. We want to establish this wall of the lodgings, which is why we're digging this trench. Morning, gents. Excuse me. And over here, this is where we're trying to get the turn of the building. Hi, Mick. Morning, Tone. And we think we know more about this wall of the building. Phil. Tony. Have we established the width of the wall yet? Yeah, we've got the other edge here, look. Look at it. Diving away there. And where's the Beautiful other one? Edge. Back against the edge of the cut there. So it's about That's right. this big? Yeah. Great. Now, this one is the one I've hardly seen at all. It just looks like a great jumble of brickwork to me. Mick, what do we know about this trench? Well, this is where the geophysics had a very sharp angle, which we think is the junction of the north wall with the west wall. So we thought we'd put this trench down over to find that. Uh, but in fact, we've lined up the robber trench now with the hoops for the, um, uh, the croquet game across here. And it must be somewhere under here. So we've extended it a bit and now we're cleaning it up. But you haven't found anything of the turn yet? 
No, we've got a, a bit of an outer edge where Greg is up the corner, but it's, it's early days yet. We're going to have a bash at it this morning and see where we get with it. And can you tell me anything about all this brickwork? No, not yet. I don't, I don't, we can't see it clearly enough yet. Well, hopefully we'll know a bit more about this one later on in the day. Straight down to the, the other trench over there. Okay. We'll take a straight measurement. Stuart has been keeping a fairly low profile this weekend, but he's obviously onto something this morning. He's measuring everything in sight. He seems particularly interested in the distances between our first three trenches. Okay, Jenny. I'm more interested in Trench 4, the one Mick and I had to get special permission for yesterday. We hope it'll hit the west wall, and it'll be very embarrassing if it doesn't. Where do you think we might have a wall, then? Well, this in the trench, we've got lots of brick rubble. And uh, we're hoping to find something up, up at this end. <laughs> when you say you're hoping to find something, have you got any indications yet? Uh, nothing in situ. It's all just rubble. So we At haven't got a wall yet. <laughs> Actually, that's improved a lot yesterday. We After the success of yesterday's <laughs> distillation, <laughs> Carenza wants to explore further the world of Tudor perfume. She's helping Hazel make an aromatic fashion accessory called a pomander. But Hazel, what are we doing here? You've given me this, this to grind up. Yes. What, what is, is it? It's benzoin, which is um, an aromatic gum from Sumatra. From Sumatra? And it's one of seven ingredients which goes to make this pomanda. The others are oris, bergamot, verbena and ambergris. Do you mm. like to smell where, does, where does that come from? Sperm well intestine. Oh, actually it does <laughs> smell as bad as you might, might expect. Outside in the trenches we're racing to finish the job. In trench one they're still trying to find a floor but the sides of the trench might collapse if they dig any deeper, so they're drilling for it instead. Trench three is undergoing another subtle expansion to find the extent of what could be more Tudor brickwork. And I'm still anxiously awaiting a wall in trench four. Come in. Over to trench two, where Stuart's Something very nice excited. Here. I think you'll like this. This is one of those moments you dream about. Yeah. What I think we've now got in this trench here, almost by luck, but based on the geophysics, we've actually hit the main entrance into the privy lodging. We put the trench in just here, and it's perfectly central, just by a good look to that facade. And if you stand just here, and look through what will be the doorway or the, a bridge going straight through the hallway of Trumpeter's house. You can see the gateway on the other side, the gatehouse. That would be the main entrance into the palace, straight along here. Isn't that marvellous? It's extraordinary, isn't the, it? And, and the, the, the kings and the queens will come straight through that hallway, in effect, of Trumpeter's house. It's marvellous. So Trench 2 hit the ghost of the north wall at just the place the main entrance would have been. And these two steps on the outside of the building were probably the footings for a bridge across the moat to the rest of the palace. Trench 2 has also produced some floor tiles from inside the building, which could be a clue to whether the privy lodgings were medieval or Tudor. So what sort of date are we talking about for these tiles, Hazel? Probably 16th, but they could equally well have been used in the 17th times. century. Yes, yeah. and they probably were something in the order of this sort oh, of right. size. Right. Um, I mean, as you can see, when you turn them over, they're really substantial because they were designed to carry a lot of weight and, and withstand heavy wear well, with heavy use. The whole rooms would have been floored with these in the palace. Ground floor rooms, yes. Ground floor rooms. What about these here? Well, these are roof tiles, and this is a sort of bit of roof that I've tried to keep, reconstruct from lots of tiles and on some of them you can see that this one is torched to give added weather, yeah. weatherproofing, She's waterproofing quality. She's plastered underneath it after, afterwards. Yes, well actually as you build up your roof yeah. you start with laying one tile, putting the torching on and then setting it onto the nets and so right. on down. I mean what these do seem to show is that they're all absolutely smashed to pieces aren't they and all you know cracked up. 
Yes. Uh, like as if, you know, some of they've been shedding off the roof as they've been pulling the, yes. the building apart. That seems very, very likely explanation. Yeah. After all his toil in Trench 2, Phil wanted a break, so I promised him a trip on the river with John Cloak. I didn't tell him who'd be driving. <laughs> well, nice, Sweating. <laughs> very nice bit of horsemanship, I think. So I feel very like being on a man. Must be fantastic, mustn't it, in Tudor times? Rowing down here and suddenly coming on this amazing yeah. palace with all these yeah. towers and weather vanes and things. Wonderful. And of course, the river wasn't just an ornament. It was the main means of communication transport from London. All the goods for the palace came down by river, what sort as of well as the people. Well, all, all that they needed, I mean, all their supplies were brought here, unloaded, taken up into the palace, and then um, ambassadors would come by water from London, and other visitors would be received here. There are many accounts of that. So it was sort of and M25, then, really? Yes. And then, um, of course, the royals would come down in their great barges. So they'd have got out of the boat just here and gone off into the palace. That's right, yes. This is Trench 4, the one that we got the special dispensation from Mrs Franklin to dig. And while all the frenzy's been going on in the other three trenches all day, Jenny's been at the bottom of this, quietly scraping away, with frankly no one paying her much attention. And all of a sudden, she's come up with this. <laughs> what is it, Jenny? Um, it's a very large wall. Uh, we thought it was much later initially because these bits have been added on later. But underneath it is a much more substantial wall that's probably the west wall of the palace. So I needn't have worried. The western wall, made of brick, not stone, is right where John Cloak and Geophysics said it would be, which just leaves Trench 3. My goodness me. Now, well, well. Where by five o'clock, Mick is finally prepared to reveal that he's found the northwest tower of the privy lodgings, and with it, a potted history of the palace. And in fact, this bit here, we're fairly clear now, is the first bit in this hole, the Which first bit, bit the one is this This bit with the two sides like that, because yes. it's got a lead drain coming out under it. This is lead sheet, yep. this here. You hear that? Yeah, it does. And that's probably coming out and going that way into the ditch or the moat that runs right across the front of the privy lodgings here. So th this block's first. Th this lot here is added onto that, probably in the base of a tower. And we can see that because we've got an edge over here and the edge up against the wall through yeah. there. And it's full of stones and mortar and plaster and all the rest of it in there. So as fashions changed or whatever, it would get right. bigger and they right. changed the shape of so it. They fill that in. The next interesting bit is if you come round this round, way, look, come right come round, round this here. Way. This big stone is the outer edge of this mass here. And it probably had another big stone there and another big stone there. And at some stage that was hoiked out because they decided to put a brick front on that. Again, the latest style. And what we can see about this is that the chap who built it, the builder who built it, could reach down mm -hmm. and fetch the mortar off uh, flush with the bricks. Whereas over here, probably because he couldn't reach, he's left the mortar oozing out between the bricks. And so original ground surface was there. And above that, the bricks are rounded and smooth where they've been worn because they've been out in the air and they've been eroded. We can't tell for sure when each of the alterations took place, but the first wall almost certainly dates back to Henry V, who built the first privy lodgings on this site. The stone-fronted tower could be his too. The final brick facade on the tower could well have been put on by Henry VII when he renovated the building after the fire in 1497. As we've got this corner turret, does this mean that we can now work out the entire shape of the privy lodging? Yeah, we know this is at the corner of the palace, so that wall must come across here. We've got the robber trench of it over there. It comes up and joins this tower somewhere, and this then has a wall running down this side, which we're hoping to get in that trench, and that must join this tower as well. So this is right at the corner of the palace. We know that the rest of it is over in that direction. 
That's wonderful. Incredible. And we're sorry about the disruption. Oh, never mind about that. When we came in and I saw the lawn, I was very worried about digging holes in it. And so I, was I. <laughs> I just hope you feel it's been worthwhile now. Absolutely. So we've done it. We've tied down the exact position of the privy lodgings. Trench four has given us the western wall. Trench three, the corner tower and moat. Trench two, the north wall. And trench one, one of the bays in the southern facade, though they never did find the floor. And John Cloak's original estimate still looks pretty good. He was just a few yards too far south. And now he's got all this information, Steve's been able to reconstruct how the privy lodgings would have looked in Queen Elizabeth's reign. Everything we've uncovered suggests this was a brick building, with only the ornamentation like window frames and door arches in stone. Much of it was rebuilt or renovated in the Tudor style by Henry VII, including the extension we found in Trench 1. And the blue decorative frieze was added by his son, Henry VIII. It would have been surrounded by water with a moat on three sides and the Thames then much wider to the south. From there, it would have dominated the surrounding countryside, an opulent monument to the Tudor dynasty. But good as it looked, it would have smelt pretty strange, judging by the results of Carenza's alchemy. Oh, yeah. What do you think of that? That's nice, eh? I mean, what's it supposed to do? If I had one, what would I do with it? <laughs> you carry it around with you to stop you getting played. Oh, so thank I'm you. I just. <laughs> but still, this is what the men would have worn in the, in the Tudor period. Civet. Is it the job? Try that. This is the men's perfume. What? Put some of that on. On? On, yes. Yes, you're <gasps> to see what, it's, see what you think yes, of it. Put it on God. you first. <laughs> what do you reckon? Wow! Do you know where it's I'm from? Back hand. <laughs> no, 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 I'm not sure that I want to know. What is it from? <laughs> Anal glands of a civet cat. <laughs> <laughs> You've been got. <laughs> we may have made a bit of a mess of this lawn, but don't worry because it's going to be put back good as new first thing tomorrow. Fingers crossed. But it's been worth it. Because now, for the first time, we know precisely where Queen Elizabeth's royal palace at Richmond stood. And I'm here, right slap bang in the middle of it.